All right, today's a big day, section 5.4, and we are looking at an entirely new number system, the imaginary numbers, okay? Um, so let's start with a definition here. The imaginary unit, which is often represented with a lowercase italicized i, it's defined to equal the square root of negative 1, okay? i equals the square root of negative 1. And um, if you think about it, we have never been able to take the square root of a negative number, right? It's not possible. There is no uh, real number that when squared gives you a negative, right? So that means that the imaginary number of i, it's not included in the real number system, okay? This is leading us to a new number system, the imaginary numbers, all right? Now, I want to look at some different powers on i. So how about i squared, all right? i squared would mean you're taking the square root of negative 1 and you're squaring it, which would equal negative 1, right? Because squaring and square rooting are inverse operations. So that's kind of interesting in that if I take an imaginary value and I square it, it results in a real number, okay? What about i cubed? Well, i cubed is simply i times i squared, which is i times negative 1 now, right? Since we just defined i squared to be negative 1. Well, i times negative 1 can be thought of as negative i. And then what about i to the fourth? Well, i to the fourth can be thought of as i squared times i squared, or negative 1 times negative 1 which results in positive one, okay? So um, these are the first four powers on i and what they simplify to. Uh, so i is itself, then i squared is negative one, i cubed is negative i, i to the fourth is positive one. And if you were to go beyond uh, the power of four, you're gonna see that there, there's gonna be a pattern at play here. This pattern's gonna repeat every four powers. So let me prove that. If I have i to the fifth, I could think of that as i squared times i cubed. Now i squared we know is negative one. i cubed we just defined to be negative i. And negative one times negative i could just be thought of as i, okay? So notice I'm getting uh, the exact same thing for i to the fifth as i to the first power, all right? So I need you to memorize the first four powers on i, all right? And I've got a little kind of mnemonic device to help you do it. Um, it's written in blue here. So if you can learn the phrase i1, i1, the middle two are negative, that'll help you remember these first four. So here, here's how I would write that out. I would say i1, i1, the middle two are negative. And what these represent is, so this is i to the first power, this is i to the second power, i to the third power, and i to the fourth power. Okay? All right, now let's move on to simplifying i raised to some larger powers, all right? We're going to go off the fact that this pattern repeats itself every four powers. So, that means I could take the power that i is being raised to, divide it by 4, and whatever the remainder is, that should uh, lead me to a simplified value for i. All right, so i to the 35th, if I take 35, I divide it by 4. And again, let's, let's make a note of this. We're, we're dividing by 4 because the pattern repeats every four powers okay so four goes into 35 evenly eight times right eight times four is 32 we're going to subtract here and i'm going to have a remainder of three okay now, the remainder is the important thing here, all right? 
the fact that the remainder of is 3 means that this is equivalent to i to the third power. And what is i to the third power equal to? Well, negative i. Okay. You really have a 50-50 shot here. The fact that i was raised to an odd power here of 35 tells me that it's going to simplify to either um, i or negative i, one of the two. Okay. And how about uh, 202, i to the power of 202? Take that, divide it by 4. All right, so 4 goes into uh, 20 five times. Right. And um, we just end up with a remainder of 2 here. Uh, well, we have to we work it all the way out. 0, 4 goes into 2, 0 times. Okay. And I end up with a remainder of 2 here. Okay, so this is going to be equivalent to i squared. And what's i squared equal to? Well, negative 1. Here we go. All right, now let's talk about pure imaginary numbers. Pure imaginary numbers are nothing more than square roots of negative real numbers. Okay, square roots of negative real numbers. So the square root of negative four is an example of a pure imaginary number. It is equivalent to 2i. All right, and the reason I can, I can uh, think of it that way is the square root of negative one can be broken up into the square, or I'm sorry, the square root of negative four can be broken up into the square root of negative one times the square root of positive four. Now we know the square root of negative one is i now, and the square root of four is of course two. So i times uh, two is of course two i, all right? Uh, similarly, square root of negative seven, I can think of this as i, times the square root of seven. That's because the square root of negative seven can be thought of as the square root of negative one times the square root of seven. Square root of negative one is defined as i, but square root of seven doesn't simplify, okay? All right, what about the square root of negative 27? Well, let me uh, start off by, I'll treat it as i times the square root of 27. Uh, 27 itself is not a perfect square. However, if you break 27 down into 9 and 3, and then 9 is 3 and 3, see how I have a pair of 3s here? Well, pairs make perfect squares, so this can simplify to 3i radical 3. Okay? All right, and then similarly, Square root of negative 2, 16, y to the fourth. I can make that i radical 2, 16, y to the fourth. And then I try to break down 2, 16. Um, it's about 108 and 2. 108, 54 and 2. 54, 6 and 9. 2 and 3. 3 and 3. So there's a pair of 2s and a pair of threes that can each be pulled out. Um, so in the end, I'll end up with, uh, let's see, three times two times i, and then let's not forget about y to the fourth. It has a square root of y squared. And then what would be left inside the radical is these two guys of two and three. They'd have to multiply back together. So in the end, I'm going to end up with, I'd write this as 6y squared i radical 6. Okay. So really the, the underlying theme here in all of these examples is if you are taking the square root of a negative number, your simplified value should have an i to it because this is a pure imaginary number. Okay. All right, now let's just look at some operations on some pure imaginary numbers, okay? So uh, let's say I'm trying to add 
two pure and add, uh, imaginary numbers together. So negative 3i added with 5i. Here's where you can treat i kind of like a regular variable. This is just going to equal 2i. Add the coefficients together. That's it. Uh, what about negative 3i times 5i? So this is an imaginary number times another imaginary number. Um, it's, again, treating i kind of like a variable here. Um, I'm initially going to make this negative 15i squared. But recall, i squared, we just learned, is equivalent to negative 1, right? So negative 15 times negative 1 gives me a simplified value of 15. Okay. All right. And then um, here is two more imaginary numbers that are being multiplied together. I just have them in their non-simplified radical forms right now. So the square root of negative 7, isn't that the same as i radical 7? That's being multiplied by square root of negative 21, which is i radical 21. Okay. So when I multiply these together, the i's multiply to give me i squared, and then I'd have underneath the radical 7 times 21, which is 147. And then I can try to simplify that. Um, so I, I need a tree here. So I created 147 from 7 and 21. 7 is 7 and 3, so right there's your pair to make a perfect square that can be pulled out. So this is 7i squared times radical 3, and 7i squared is really negative 7 radical 3. Okay. All right, and then our last example of the video here. Um, Let's solve these quadratic equations, and we're going to see that their solutions end up being imaginary solutions, okay? So if I have 2x squared plus 8 equal to 0, what I want you to notice is there's no middle term here with uh, a variable of x in it. So this one's really easy to solve. I can uh, subtract 8 over, and then I can divide both sides by 2 going to take me to x squared equals negative 4, and then I can take a square root on both sides of the equation, and that'll lead me to x equals the square root of negative 4, which we have to use plus or minus on, right? Whenever you take the square root on both sides of an equation, you always need plus or minus. Now, what is the square root of negative 4? It is 2i. Okay. So here's your first taste of a quadratic equation that has two imaginary solutions to it and no real solutions. Okay. Now I can check these answers by simply plugging them back into the original equation for x. How about I check positive 2i? So 2 multiplied by 2i raised to the second power plus 8. I want to see if that simplifies to 0. Well, first thing I would have to do here is I'd take 2i and I'd square that. That's going to lead me to 4i squared. 2 times 4i squared is the same as 2 times negative 4. 2 times negative 4 is negative 8. And of course, negative 8 plus 8 gives me 0, right? So there's your proof that uh, this is, in fact, a solution to the original equation. Okay. All right. Uh, one final example here. Same kind of approach. Um, notice it's a very similar makeup, and then it's missing that middle term. So I can just add 12 over, divide by negative 1. So I have x squared is equal to negative 12. I'll square root both sides. And x is going to equal plus or minus the square root of negative 12. 
Now I break negative 12 down. Actually, I'll I'll uh, I'll treat it as just 12. 12 is three and four. Four is two and two. So there's a pair of twos there. So in the end, this is going to simplify to plus or minus 2i. I've got to pull an i out since the 12 was negative, and then times the square root of 3. And once again, you could check that uh, either one of those solutions there if you want to plug back in um, for x and then simplify. Okay.